maybe we'd like to begin with uh, Dr. Uh, Joseph. Um, I think yes. there are some questions directed to um, the Philippines Trauma Service. Yes. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Lina. Uh, be, before we ask the questions, uh, with the indulgence of Dr. Raj. Dr. Raj, you mentioned that there are, you have, uh, you have uh, some uh, questions. Uh, maybe we can ask them later. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, just to share the comments on the chat box, uh, this is actually not a question, but uh, just to read the, the comments from the chat box from Russell Gruen. Uh, Ted, thank you for your very generous and thoughtful comments and sharing your great wisdom and experience. Love it. Rivers of information, lakes of knowledge, and droplets of wisdom. Yeah, definitely, uh, this is all about, uh, this ACT is all about collaboration. And also, there is a question uh, coming from uh, Steve, Dr. Stephen Nasiad uh, to Dr. Herbosa. Good evening, Dr. May I ask Dr. Herbosa if what hospitals in the Philippines that offer trauma fellowships and is there any available straight trauma surgery residency training in the Philippines? Uh, Dr. Uh, Herbosa. Right now, right now, we are not offering a fellowship, but we are planning to open up because of our national trauma fellowship program that we're cooking up. Uh, We've had several observerships uh, of, uh, we have a tie up with USUS, University of Uniformed Services of the US. We, we have uh, uniformed services from the US that actually do trauma experience in my hospital, which is an urban city hospital care of my, one of my graduates, Dr. Eric Talitz, who also teaches there at the uh, USUS in, uh, in Bethesda. And uh, we, we, well, I think I, <laughs> Professor Russell is nothing because Eric also does work with Alfred Royal Alfred as well. He's, he's a, my first fellow graduate. He's actually my first trauma fellow graduate in, uh, and so is Joseph. <laughs> Joseph is much later. But uh, uh, what has happened is for several decades, no other hospital offered a trauma fellowship program like ours until only recently, we're in the one where Joseph is working now, Jose Reyes developed a fellowship program. Uh, more recently, one of our graduates, uh, Dr. Orlando Ocampo, decided that we should actually have a nationwide fellowship program because we're now building what is called national trauma centers. Uh, we've identified hospitals that will be built as trauma centers. So we have a whole cadre of young surgeons that we need to train to actually build the manpower to build uh, the Philippine trauma system. So we, we, we still welcome uh, foreigners and uh, people uh, right after the COVID pandemic is over. Well, we do hope that you can come and visit us in the Philippines. There's a lot to learn from uh, Philippine trauma care because we work in very austere environments with the little resources, with only our brains and our hands to actually use sometimes. Very similar to the situation probably in some parts of Africa. But uh, there are some wisdoms we get out of working in very austere environments. And that's my subspecialty field is disaster medicine, which is really working in uh, situations wherein uh, you have very, very little uh, resources and then the needs are much more than the uh, resources available. So we, we put this in uh, disaster health systems and there are some good points of what you can learn in uh, coming to a country like the Philippines. Thanks, Dr. Theodora. And uh, my name is Raj. I'm a trauma and vascular surgeon from Singapore. And we have collected quite a few questions that have come in uh, from today's audience for the various speakers as well. And perhaps I could just address the first question over um, to Dr. Mosquito. Um, Mosquito. Uh, we have a question coming in about ATLS and ETC. And for countries which are still deciding between the two different uh, programs, what would you advise is more appropriate for each sector? Both the, the ATLS is essentially a, a longitudinal approach. Uh, it has been designed, designed from the beginning for the surgeon working alone, or the doctor, not just the surgeon, the doctor working alone with low resources in a in a in a in a, a low resources setting. The European trauma course. Uh, Came, uh, came after the ATLS and is a, a trauma team approach. So it has been designed for the, the, the doctor working in a team in, in the hospital. So uh, what we are doing, for example, here in Coimbra, who 
because we have both courses in Portugal, if we didn't, it will probably it will be different. But when we have the possibility to have both courses, um, and this is also a recommendation from the European Society. And what we do in Coimbra, we do not uh, accept residents for the European Trauma Course uh, if they, the, they didn't uh, the ATLS first. Different if it is a specialist, a senior, okay, then we accept it with no problem. For the residents, we, we, have, we put a limitation. They, they need to do the ATLS first. Thanks, Dr. Mesquita. Um, just another question for you as well is coming in regarding the role of simulation and communication, especially in um, encouraging communication. I'm just wondering about your experience in using simulation in order to improve intra-team communications and um, what's your experience been on that? One of, thank you for that question, because it also, um, we really started paying attention to that when we, we decided to, to, to bring the European Trauma Course to, to, for Portugal, because essentially the, the European Trauma Course is a, is a course on non-technical skills. The, the important part is really the communication, and uh, we are also doing that um, between the, the candidates uh, of the DSTC course, uh, because normally we do it with uh, simultaneously for the, the DATC for anesthesiologists and the DPMTC for nurses. And also there, we always put at least a lecture on communication because the, it, uh, we, we are all very good. We know a lot, but when it is about to, to teamwork, it, it is a disgrace. So we really need to 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 learn how to how to work as a team. And probably it's more important that the 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 volume of knowledge that each one of us has individual. Thanks, Dr. Mesquita. Thank um, you very much. I have a couple of questions uh, for Dr. Gruen, and um, this is in regards to building up uh, in, in a, a trauma system. And um, I suppose this is a question quite close to my heart as well, but, but the question came in about how do you quantify the benefit of a trauma system to administrators and policy makers in terms, in, term, in a level at which they would understand financially? How do you equate productivity from life save, for example, um, to making a case for hiring and building up the resources you need for a trauma system. Yeah, thank you. So um, the language of lives saved, lives improved speaks to everybody, including administrators and politicians. So I think that that, that is your natural starting point. And there are now enough mature systems that have demonstrated significant benefits to the whole of society um, through lives saved and lives improved uh, that uh, you, you can point to those successful systems and say, we can do that here too, because we know the components of a successful trauma system and uh, the trauma community globally can help us uh, design the, the ideal trauma system for our city or our state. What is harder to do, but still possible, is to calculate financial data about costs per, not just life saved, but life improved. So the language of disability adjusted life years um, and uh, years of life lost and that those sorts of languages that puts trauma alongside other types of illness uh, and disease and allows you to compare the burden of trauma with the, the burden of chronic disease or you know, acute respiratory disease or childhood illness and so on. So that might be useful in certain settings as well. And then there's the, the actual dollars or whatever your currency is figure around the cost per case. And that's, uh, that's obviously very specific to your own situation and the way health financing works. But if you can demonstrate change over time um, and Victoria has done so through the work of Linda Gabe and, and Peter Cameron, for example, and so you could look that, that up. Uh, they showed that the system led to not just a reduction in trauma deaths and in, an improvement in trauma outcomes, but also reduced costs per case managed. Um, so that's, that's kind of the full hand. If you've got that, um, that that's a clean sweep in, in poker or whatever, <laughs> whatever game we're playing. Um, if you can deliver that to, to your um, 
uh, administrators and use it for advocacy. But don't forget we're a community, we're a global community. There, we have, there are now good examples of all of this from many countries and uh, we should be pointing that out. We know what works, we know what the components are. We also know that they have to be designed bespoke for each community. You can't just pick up the trauma system from Victoria or, or Brisbane and Queensland and drop it into even another place in Australia. That They do need to be tailored to the local environment. But there's plenty of knowledge on what the components are and how to do that and uh, plenty of ways to measure whether it's working or not. Thank you. And um, just another question on um, standardizing care um, across the across it's so many different hospitals across your across the various regions uh, you work with. How important is it that every hospital is doing the same thing, or should we even be um, targeting that as an objective? With standardized protocols, or should we just let hospitals do their own thing and just use outcome measures? Instead? That's a really great question, and it's one that I think. Um, uh, the more you dive into answering that question, the, the more complex it, it is apparent. Um, the, the, the initial response is, of course, everybody should be doing guideline-based best practice care and, and, and trauma guidelines, even the, the kind of early resuscitation ABC algorithms have done an enormous amount to support better trauma care across the world. Um, some of them have even been put into computerized decision modules to support resuscitation environments and, and so on. In the National Trauma Registry Project in Australia, we, we followed the, the approach that Avery Nathans and the, in the American College of Surgeons had done um, with their National Registry and looked at outcomes for trauma centers um, standardized for various characteristics of patient and injury and tried to rank um, uh, centers from on a, a observed over expected outcomes from lowest to highest performing center. You might be familiar with these sorts of plots, they're often called caterpillar plots. And uh, it's possible to do that when you have uh, enough centers and enough data for each center and, uh, and some points on which you can standardize. Now, of course, there's a lot of questions about whether, you know, what it takes to standardize appropriately. But it's a very interesting exercise where the goal is to understand really what it is that the high-performing centers do differently that makes them high-performing centers and what the low-performing centers do differently that makes them low-performing and perhaps they can learn from high-performing centers to do something differently. It's not straightforward to do any of that. Um, it's a great exercise to do it. The conversations are really fantastic. I think the science still has a long way to go and we, we probably aren't measuring all the important variables in standard trauma registries. And uh, if there's one thing I, I would love to see is kind of a rethinking of the components of a trauma registry uh, on a statewide or national basis because I think we, we've come a long way in knowing what, what, what it is in trauma and what to measure in the last 50 years and our registries haven't, uh, haven't mod modified and modernized along with that thinking. Thank you very much. Um, just uh, changing track slightly, and um, these are questions targeted at, uh, perhaps uh, first at Dr. Martin. Um, and this, regard, this is in regards to how your contingency plans changed uh, with COVID, especially with results to mass casualty or major incidents uh, during COVID. Um, and I was just wondering whether um, as a hospital system that you had to make those changes to accommodate this, uh, especially for a stressful situation like a major incident or a mass casualty incident? Thank you for the question. Um, well, fortunately, we, don't, we didn't have any mass casualty events um, during this pandemic. Um, now the storm season is coming, so we might get and, uh, um, yeah, the storm and uh, our hurricane season is coming, so see how we go. Um, we, we embedded, basically, our mass casualty plans into our pandemic plans and make sure that they match and, and, and integrate with each other. 
Um, and then we definitely did a lot of simulations. So we, we here, we heard it before. So we do a fair bit of simulation exercises and not just uh, actually team-based, we do it also process-based. So uh, we take uh, a mock patient um, from a handover in the emergency department through to a CD scanner up to the uh, theaters and then also do that with mass casualty uh, basically with uh, multiple uh, mock scenarios. Um, so to really uh, test the system, test our protocols, our roles, um, and what, we, what we've put in place, um, and then imp improve it. And, and also we've done that the same um, within a COVID scenario as well. So really just to look into it, um, I can only highlight that the simulation exercises, they really helped us to improve um, and it's so, not so much about technicalities it's really about team communication working together but um, through those exercises quite interestingly actually that a lot of staff that weren't directly involved in the exercise they were sort of curious they've seen that we do something so they got us talking so basically then throughout the hospital it, it just caught momentum talking actually about what's the plan where do we go what's my role and, and i think that's what we want to achieve that everybody knows what to do um, in case dr moing um, your, your your thoughts on that on managing a major incident during covid i think i think i'll agree with what uh, martin has said i think from our point of view whatever we need to do has to be able to match our knowledge on covid 19 as well as the protocols that have helped us. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We just need to match those two together. And from what we've learned, obviously the PPE will be one of the things that we don't do differently. But the issue of triaging, how we triage sieve, how we decide who needs to do what, uh, that should still be based on the fundamental lessons we've learned before on mass casualty incidents. What we found as a challenge for us is that most of our group that is working on the COVID, on, on the mass casualty and disasters has actually been part of our joint operation uh, management team. So it has been very difficult for us to maintain our usual uh, drills, et cetera, et cetera, the way that we used to do outside COVID. And we found ourselves having to deal with the management of massive numbers of COVID in a way as a form of, 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 of mass casualty or mass management within the hospital. But it has been difficult to go back to the norm where the number of drills, the number of people that we used to have on the drills, the ability, especially in the middle of a pandemic, the ability to do those debriefing in general, we had to adapt that uh, in such a way that we don't contravene the, the crowd control measures that are required for COVID-19. But it's a match and mix and match of those two principles that all of us will have to look into. Are we going to be caught in surprise? Yes, possibly some of our members that have joined us in the past few times might find themselves not as well acquitted and as well knowledgeable about our protocols for disaster management. But there's a reality of what we are facing now with limited resources. I think that's a great point, actually, about being prepared for what is our core mission um, and not being distracted too much by COVID, but at the same time taking good precautions to make sure our staff are safe. And perhaps um, just one last question addressed that for both uh, Dr. Martin and Dr. Moeng, about how you manage to keep your team uh, morale up, how you manage to keep them feel safe um, and keep them secure while managing major trauma incidents in this, during this pandemic. Perhaps Dr. Martin first, then Dr. Moeng. That's, that's a very good question. <laughs> um, look, I, I think fr from my perspective as a passionate trauma leader, it's really to take the, 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 the team on the journey um, and just being open, being transparent, talking through issues, having regular debriefs as well. I think that's something that we don't do that well. Um, just debrief and it might be just part of a team or a smaller team or a trauma service or it might be a bigger one um, just to communication talk with each other there were always problems and and at the bottom line we we're always having some or the other struggles 
in life, and it's not just pandemic uh, related, I guess. So as a leader, take it serious, take the team members on a journey um, and um, be motivated. I mean, motivational or positive or however we are the type of person we are to really reflect that and, and take, uh, take people in, in our teams. Um, having said that, it hasn't been always easy. Um, and I guess all of us have been in circumstances or in situations where we felt close to burnout or that sort of scenario. So, and that's where I think it's really important to have good relationships around us so that we can have um, a chat, a one-on-one -on -one or just a smaller team chat and drop off our struggles as well. Uh, because yeah, nobody's bulletproof. Um, so again, show vulner vulnerability as well um, and authenticity, um, sorry, right, it's late in the evening. <laughs> um, just be transparent and honest um, to and go on a journey together. So that would be my, or is my approach really. And um, it went it went quite far so so far in the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Moy. And just to add on, I, th I think I think I think it's been really covered for us. That constant feedback as to what is a real state. You, you don't have to hide anything. What is a real state? What what, what is happening? Uh, the issues about the healthcare workers. So part of what we did in our hospital was to be open about the positive numbers within our healthcare system. Uh, as I can give you now with Om o o Omicron within a space of about 18 days to 21 days, about 10% of our staff was affected. That's how quickly and how rapidly it grows. But again, mixed with that message was the issue of saying, uh, but look at how many are hospitalized and how many we are losing. And, and actually the mortality rate has been low. And uh, that sharing of that information, even when we bring it to the subgroup of trauma and trauma people uh, in our hospital, we, we, we are very close. It's a, it's a different community. We have team approaches. We, we link up with different fears, different groups. And that was, uh, that was what has made trauma unique in a sense that we can look at after each other and support each other a little bit better. But I found that one of the things from the leading of a unit point of view over and above the other disaster management uh, roles was that it was very important to also generally get a sound of where people are. When you, when you notice that somebody is struggling a little bit, you know, find ways of helping out and assisting each other. You don't have to wait for somebody to actually wind down into a deep end. And if you learn to intervene and, and assist with psychological support earlier, be willing to pick up some of the calls when you see somebody struggling. Because one of the things that we faced was that there have been one or two of our healthcare workers with long-term chronic effects. So when somebody comes to you with the long-term cardiac events, you, you, don't, you don't make it personal. You, you understand it's a journey for them that might not affect other members of the healthcare, uh, healthcare uh, team. And, and, and we'll find ways to make it easy for them to deal with it. But it's a reality that it is here. It's a reality that it has changed our mindset. People are accepting it more and more every day. The presence of vaccination has had its role, except that again, we need to, to have our boosters over and over again. But that openness and ability to surveil every day can make a huge difference in building and assisting the morale of the team. Thank you very much for those very strong leadership lessons, Dr. Martin and Dr. Moeng. Um, I think those are the questions that I have uh, from the forum. Um, over uh, and back to the moderators. Thank you, Dr. Raj. Um, Dr. Joseph, do you uh, have any, qu any other questions from your end? Uh, no questions at my end, uh, Dr. Lynette. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, maybe I'd like to ask um, uh, Dr. Moeng a question because uh, he's really facing the heat of the pandemic. Um, how do you uh, equip and work together with the, with the pandemic ICU in treating all these major polytrauma patients? How, um, what was the process like? Was it just everybody just rise up or the to rise up to the situation ad hoc or do you go through a um, period of uh, briefing, assessments, training, etc.? Uh, thank you very much. W one of the things was a change in the mindset. 
changing the mindset was a concept of redeployment. All of us from consultant to a surgeon, to a pediatrician, to a radiologist, we, as soon as we were running into problems with the numbers, we were all happy and ready to be reassigned and do what needs to be done. So when it came to the ICUs, for example, we run our own trauma ICU. So we will ventilate and manage like that other patient that I presented earlier. We will manage those patients and some of them will put them in COVID positive uh, wards. But even in the ICU, we had to assist as well from trauma when they were running short of calls and people to assist with ICU work, we needed to adjust and work around them. Obviously, there was a need for education. So the protocols, the management, the special medication that you use in COVID would have been part of the training that you offer. We did that as well with the nursing teaching. Some of the nurses that might have not been critically care trained, we were able to give them short lessons and short courses on dealing with high flow oxygen ventilation and let them work under assistant with another group. But unless all, all, all of you as healthcare workers in a facility join forces and people stop thinking as in silos, it doesn't matter whether I'm a breast surgeon, it doesn't matter whether I'm an intern, but if there is a need and a call with the appropriate education and support, I can be able to play a role uh, within that need under pressure of a, of a fifth wave. And at the moment we're going through our fourth waves. If I have to tell you all the other challenges we've had, we've been able to uh, shut off the whole hospital oxygen in the middle of a wave and we never lost one patient. But again, that speaks around coordination and bringing that disaster management back into the mind frame of everybody else. So at the moment, uh, that would be the things that I'll suggest around the practical challenges in the middle of a pandemic of making sure that you can offer more, even with less number of people available in your units.